So I am really excited. I've been looking forward to this event ever since I dreamt it up um, in November. Uh, Francine Segan is the author of this wonderful cookbook, Shakespeare's Kitchen. And Chef Jessica and I have been talking for years about having an event that would be about Shakespeare's Kitchen. And as I was looking through Francine's book, trying to get ideas, I thought, well, why don't we just have Francine come? And so I emailed her and she was very forthcoming and excited to talk to us about her passion, which is food history. And so we're gonna be hearing from Francine. She's also written a wonderful book on classical philosophy and foods. Maybe we'll bring her back again for another exciting event. But today we're gonna to really focus on the Elizabethan kitchen and food as it appears in Shakespeare. And we're gonna also have some recipes demonstrated by our wonderful partner, Chef Jessica Van Roo here at the Anteater Recreation Kitchen. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted to be with everyone. So for the next bit, I am going to talk about the wonderful fanciful foods and feasting of Shakespeare's time. The food was amazingly delicious and fun and interesting. They ate things like peacocks, and swans. In fact, you see here in this beautiful painting, the wide range of foods that were prepared for a feast. They ate everything. Uh, most particularly, I was really fascinated reading chapter after chapter on pies. Pies are a wonderful vehicle for the fancifulness of the Elizabethan feast. And you see in this painting that there is a swan that's sitting on a pie crust. And that would have been an actual swan that would have been skinned so the feathers stay intact. And then the swan would have been roasted and the feathers put back on and the swan put on top of a pie that was filled with swan meat. And this would have been one of the wonderful things sent out to the table. I had hundreds and hundreds of pies um, that are featured in various cookbooks of the time. Even turkey pie and meat pies, they loved to decorate the crust of the pie to reflect what was inside the pie. So the way we saw the swan on top of a pie, this pie crust is a recreation of one from Elizabethan kitchens where the boar meat that is inside is recreated on the outside in the crust. And you see the gilding, that also was very common in those Elizabethan kitchens. They would also make the pie into the shape of what was inside. And today we're going to see this pie be made by our wonderful chef, Jessica. This is a salmon pie with some very bizarre ingredients. In fact, when I first read this recipe, I thought I would make it as an experiment for some guests as a way to show how terrible Elizabethan food was. And to my thinking from just reading it, it seemed kind of strange. There was salmon, pistachios, artichoke, asparagus, mussels or clams. I just thought it was gonna be a horrendous hodgepodge. I made it and made a small portion and gave all the guests a little spoon to have just a taste. Everyone was furious with me. It was delicious. They wanted more. Um, it, it turned out that that crazy combination of flavors and textures actually worked really well. And so we'll see how that's made a little later on. Even today, the English are kind of whimsical with their pies. And today there's a pie that dates from the Elizabethan period. Uh, it's called stargazy pie, where a fish pie with all the heads of the fish poking out uh, of the crust, something that they did very regularly. They would like to not only decorate the pie, but also have the ingredients actually poking out from the pie crust. Now, pies were often a part of the whimsical part of the dinner. Sometimes they weren't even edible. There was recipes for pies that were just intended to be showstoppers, something to wow the guests. We know the rhyme, four and 20 blackbirds. It's true, it was a recipe. They explained to the chef how 
He should blind bake a crust, bake the crust with nothing in it, uh, and then put in live birds, cover it quickly with the top crust, and send it to the table, give the guest of honor a dull knife so that when he cuts into the pie, no birds are hurt, but they'll be released into the room and fly about. What I particularly liked about that recipe was the last line that said, if you're having trouble tethering the birds, don't worry, this recipe will delight if you use garden snakes or frogs also. I like when they give you substitution for ingredients in, in recipes. Another thing that they incorporated into the meal for a wow factor was to sculpt and shape the food. For example, this is one of my favorite recipes, pears in broth. Pears, uh, it is actually chopped meat, seasoned, and then shaped into the shape of a small pear with a little herb at the top. They even had a little extra conceit, which is that you were ex they explained to put a whole grape in the center of the pear so that when the guests bit into it, thinking they were getting a pear, but then realizing it was meat, they would still get a little tiny bite of fruit inside. And it's actually really delicious, um, a nice combination of sweet and savory. This idea of preparing food into other shapes is something that of course has remained, uh, as we know from the wonderful marzipan sculptured fruits that are so popular in Sicily and other parts of the world. The Elizabethans also gave us many of our Christmas specialties like gingerbread men, because creating bread and cookies in the shapes, for example, of a guest of honor, was very common. Uh, they would also create dinner rolls into various shapes. One of the recipes that was very fascinating was a dinner roll in the shape of a deer. And the instructions went on to explain that you should fill the dinner roll with wine jelly so that when the guests opened their dinner roll, it would seem as if the deer was bleeding. I know. They thought it was very appetizing sounding. Uh, and of course, we remember that in Elizabethan times, hunting deer was something that was only reserved for the wealthy. And so the idea of recreating that hunt was something appealing. Now, one of the things that's interesting when you look at a cookbook from Shakespeare's time is how different it looks from cookbooks today. For example, here's a page and you can see how dense the writing is. It's also not broken up into that little paragraph with ingredients and instructions. It was, again, uh, very, very dense because paper was very, very rare. Some things we notice when we read it that are missing, that are common today are time. We now easily will see a recipe that says bake for 10 minutes. Not so in Shakespeare's time. Clocks were expensive and would never have been found in a kitchen. And so other kinds of hints had to be given to the cook. Uh, one of my favorites was instructions for how long to cook asparagus. And the instructions said, cook them for as long as it takes to say the Lord's Prayer twice. It actually turns out pretty good timing for, for asparagus, which doesn't need very much cooking time. The other thing that's missing, of course, is the temperature on the oven. There were no thermostats to control temperature. And so they would give other clues. For example, there was one for baking rolls that said, make the oven hot enough so that you can keep your hand in the oven for the count of 12. So I'm in the kitchen testing for Shakespeare's kitchen uh, and doing that. And it turns out that I can keep my hand in for about 12 seconds with 350 degrees, which was perfect for those rolls. Now, today we have drugstores on every corner, not so in Shakespeare's time. Instead, cookbooks would be often a source for remedies and cures. And these cookbooks would be a way that um, the household could prepare things 
for illnesses. And when you read them, it's fascinating. There are things like cherry bark that's repeated on and on as a cure for sore throats. And of course, we know cherry bark and the flavor of cherry is very popular in cough drops and cough medicines because cherry indeed does soothe a, thro a sore throat. Many people believe that a copper bracelet will help with arthritis. And in Elizabethan times, they believed that cooking with coins would help joint aches. And there would be these elaborate stews that were called for cooking many, many hours with various coins in them. That's not actually as strange as it sounds. You may know that cooking in a cast iron pot is a wonderful way to increase iron um, for anyone iron deficient or who like to get more iron in their diet. There were dozens and dozens of recipes that kept alluding to the fact that you could cure deafness, cure it with a roasted onion. I was intrigued and luckily I was doing research in the New York Academy of Medicine, a medical facility that had a huge culinary collection because there were so many remedies that the physicians wanted to explore the history of. And so I got the chance to ask some doctors seated near me, is anyone an eye, ear, and throat specialist? Um, and a few people came over and I said, why are there so many cookbooks that claim that you can cure deafness? Uh, if we knew this, this would be revolutionary. And they explained that actually about 15% of the population over age 50 develops a earwax that is so thick, it actually blocks hearing. And so in Shakespeare's time, they would use this juice of the roasted onion, which actually has an enzyme that loosens the earwax. And so they thought it was an absolute cure. They weren't deaf anymore. Today, we have the little blue pill. But back in Shakespeare's time, they used food. And there are many, many recipes that uh, talk about increasing the seed in man, um, but there were also many that were directed to women. I especially liked one that was entitled How to Make a Barren Woman Bear a Child. And the recipe goes on to explain that you need to make a pesto, grind up about 12 different kinds of nuts and about 20 different kinds of herbs and have that eat that pesto twice a day and use the leaves of all of the herbs to make a concoction that you would drink three times a day. And the instructions went on to explain that you should do this remedy, take this remedy every day for 40 days, and it guaranteed within the 40 days that a barren woman will become pregnant. The very last line of the recipe explains that during the period of taking the remedy, it might be beneficial to make the acquaintance of a man. Nowadays, we put the more important ingredients first, but back then. So we've got lots of appliances in the kitchen. A whisk, they didn't back then. They would ins have instructions in cookbooks of how to tie together twigs so that they could create their own whisks. We use a pastry brush to brush on egg white or butter. Back then, they would have instructed you to use a feather. We use toothpicks to close uh, different food for appetizers. They did too, but they used a quill. We've got salad spinners. Back then, they would have instructed you to put all the lettuce in a big linen cloth and swing it around your head. It still works if you don't have a salad spinner. Here's a page from a beautiful Italian cookbook that was known in Shakespeare's England that has instructions for how to lay out a kitchen, including in one corner, um, let me do my laser pointer here, um, you see this, this, the instruction for this was that you should take a, um, a bale of hay and hang it uh, so that when you're using knives, you can put them into the bale of hay. It would not only clean the knives, but keep them from harm's way. And there's um, lots of other instructions on how to set up uh, pasta making stations and instructions on how to create cookware and spits, pots, um, all with, would have been within cookbooks. So 
the Elizabethans were eating from snout to tail, all sorts of foods. Um, and we can see references, interesting references in uh, Shakespeare to foods like in Taming of the Shrew, Neat's foot, which is a calf's foot. They ate everything, including coxcomb, which is something that still today, actually, you can find in Italy uh, in a dish called La Financiera, uh, a dish popular in northern Italy. There are a few spices that I want to mention because I thought they were so delicious uh, and easy to find, actually, but they were new to me uh, when I was doing research. One was kubeb, which looks kind of like an allspice with a tail, and it's wonderfully aromatic, kind of a combination of nutmeg, cinnamon, and pepper long pepper, which isn't actually a pepper, uh, but it looks like a, a little pine cone, but it's about the size of your pinky nail, also has a wonderful heat, but a lot of aromatics. And the other that I thought was delicious, spicy, tingly, was grains of paradise. Those three are spices that are easy to find online, and I highly encourage you to look for them to add a little taste of Elizabethan food to anything simple, even a, a roast chicken. Now, one of the questions I'm always asked is, they put all these spices in foods. Was it to, to camouflage the fact that the meat was rancid? Absolutely not. I'm convinced because there were recipes that explain in the beginning of the recipe what time you should slaughter the animal so that you could properly prepare the dish in time for a feast. So these flavors were just appreciated and a part of the cuisine. They probably weren't quite as strong as the uh, spices we have today because they were traveling on camels and in pouches that weren't airtight uh, for hundreds of miles. So what would it have been like to attend a feast back in Shakespeare's time? You would have received your invitation and you would have arrived at the Grand Hall and someone would have greeted you with a pitcher with scented water so you could have your hands washed after the dusty trip. And then you would be escorted to the table where, where you sat was very important because not everyone received all of the wonderful dishes. Not everybody got the peacock. Uh, in fact, salt wasn't even at everyone's place. And the expression below the salt comes from the fact that only some people were seated near the salt and the others below it. You would have seen a white tablecloth and you would have found that roll at your place, probably wrapped in your napkin, which you would have used to take home leftovers. You would not have found a fork. Forks were not known in Shakespeare's time. In fact, a travel writer traveling to the continent who saw them in Italy during Shakespeare's lifetime and wrote about it, marveled at, at why gentlemen in the courts of Italy weren't sophisticated enough to know how to properly eat with their fingers. Wine was an integral part of dinners, and there were beautiful wine fountains on the table and wonderful dispensers like this, carved quartz. Now, we say to make a toast, and that saying dates to Shakespeare's time. As you see from this quote from Mary Wives of Windsor, the reason is that in Shakespeare's time, there were not yet bottled wine that was as delicious as what people would taste when they went to the continent. And so in England, they would put a piece of toast into the glass to act as kind of a charcoal filter. And the expression drink to the toast, meaning drink down, uh, led to our drinking a toast. And toasting, that clinking your glasses together, because actually in Shakespeare's time, they weren't really glass. They were fairly expensive glass glasses. Uh, they used pewter, other metals. Uh, they would clink them together so hard so that one drink could slosh into the other, showing everyone assembled that we're drinking the same thing. And that was a way for the guest of honor to prove to the um, host that he's not being po poisoned. We drinking to your health. Everyone is having the same thing. They were very worried about poison, as you know, in Macbeth. And there were many glasses that were created that were supposed to be antidotes, like, like this rhinoceros horn 
cup or crystals were thought to prevent it. There were lots of games with drinking like this pass gloss, glasses like this with little secret holes and ways that you have to cover up different opening so that you could get your drink, uh, as well as trick glasses like this one, which would crawl, mechanical glass that would crawl around the table and you had to grab the glass quickly, drink and get it back on uh, before it got out of reach. Or this beautiful ship drinking vessel where you had to figure out which cannon you drank through and which you needed to cover to create the right vacuum. Then would come trumpeting and the first courses would come, which are all little small, wonderful things like meat pies and things that we associate with appetizers and fantastic, fanciful things like a roast suckling pig with a capon sitting on top of it with the uh, coat of arms. There would be entertainments, jugglers, magicians, all sorts of entertainments. And you as the guest would also be expected to entertain. And there were etiquette books that explained jokes. Um, for example, there was one book uh, that I read that was published during Shakespeare's lifetime that listed jokes, kind of the way the old time Henny Youngman sort of comedians in the Borscht Belt would do. Uh, one joke, for example, said that suddenly there was a storm at sea. And the captain ran to the ship and asked all the passengers, please, please, who can throw something overboard to lighten our load? And a man quickly raised his hand and said, I can, my wife. Well, I'm thinking is Henny Youngman who did research in the same place as I did to get these jokes. Uh, but it was pretty funny for 1599. I will end this section on a riddle, which was very common to have riddles that you'd kind of memorize and bring with you to the feast so that you could share. Uh, and, and this one sounds like it's X-rated, but it's actually a PG answer, you'll see. And thus my riddle doth begin. A maid would have a thing put in, and with her hand she brought it to. It was so meek it would not do. But at length she used it so that to the whole she made it go. And when it had done as she could wish, aha, quoth she, I'm glad of this. So what do you think? What do you think she was trying to get in the hole? She was, well, I don't know what you thought. Well, don't say it out loud, but she was threading a needle. <laughs> All right, so then we, we would enjoy the, the next courses which would have been larger pieces of meats and fish. And now I will stop here so that we can learn how to make that delicious salmon pie. That was wonderful, Francine. And our, um, a reminder to the audience, if you have questions, you can put those into the Q&A. We also do have a live chat, so you can just ooh and ah over um, some of the pictures that we're seeing and the jokes that we're seeing and uh, just kind of enjoy the evening together. Take it away, Chef Jessica. All right, so I'm gonna show you that beautiful pie that uh, Francine showed you. I'm, uh, I'm gonna try to make it that beautiful, but I'm gonna do half of this. And so, like I said, I will be sending out these recipes at the end of the event so that you too can make them. And so this salmon dish actually uses puff pastry. So you can just go out and buy puff pastry and Pillsbury is usually the one that we have around and you keep it frozen until you're ready to use it. And so I let it out and it is just a small sheet like this. I'm gonna do half the recipe. The recipe that I'm sending you serves 12 people. And so I'm gonna do a half of that portion, which I think is enough. Um, and what that entails, is me taking this piece of dough and I'm gonna roll it out a little bit and I'm gonna cut it in half. So I put a little bit of flour on top of it and I'm just gonna roll it around. And if you notice, I'm doing everything on the parchment sheet. It just helps with transferring it. I've tried this recipe out and it's amazing. Um, when we talk about food, we always talk about flavors and complementing flavors. And so we always want um, our sweet, our sour, our savory, our umami, and textures too are also super important in food. So what this recipe actually does is it encompasses all of those things. It's sweet, it's savory, and it's got a little bit of a crunch to it too. 
So I'm gonna put that, part, uh, that rolled out kind of puff pastry to the side and then I've got a piece of salmon here. And you want a boneless, skinless piece. Um, if you wanna know a good place to buy salmon, I always say Costco. And so if you have a piece of salmon like mine, what you're going to do is you want pieces that are about equal in size, about two inches by three inches. And what ends up happening is if you have this little tail at the end, it's usually thinner. So what I actually do is I'll tuck it underneath and then I'm gonna cut sections of this. And then for area, so you want it about equal size. And so I'll cut this in half. And then I'll do this too. So I've got even pieces of fish that I'm then going to put into my, ah, that I'm gonna put inside my parchment. Now let's get the rest of the ingredients together. These are the other great ingredients. We have some pistachios, artichoke bottoms. So if you don't know what artichoke bottoms are, Instacart didn't know either. So artichoke hearts are what we normally see in the grocery store. And so it's an artichoke and it's got like that kind of side coming up. Even the canned ones, even the frozen ones have a little bit more of that leaf to it. These are artichoke bottoms. And so it's just the bottom of the artichoke and you can find them in the can section usually. And there's about eight or nine in each one. And so you only need about half. So I have four that I'm gonna use and I'm gonna slice them. So I'm just going to thinly slice them. And if you wanna cut them smaller, you sure can. Then the other ingredient are green grapes. Now the recipe says that you can also use gooseberries. Gooseberries are a little hard to find, but I don't want you to make the mistake that I make. Nowadays you see these guys around. And I'm sure this could probably work well inside. These are Cape Cod gooseberries. They are not, or golden berries. They are not real gooseberries though. They're a different, they're, they look similar, but they're not the same. So you could probably use these. Um, if you've never tried them before, they're really good. They're tart, um, but they have more of a bite. It has like more of a skin on it. So I've got green grapes that I'm gonna use and you can just roughly chop them. I halved them. It's really cool the, um, having the grapes inside just because it, lends that sweetness and that little sourness to this um, dish. And then, so I've got all these on the side. And then I have asparagus. So six or 12, so I'm doing half, so six asparagus stalks. I just wanted to show you, when you buy these asparagus, what you wanna do is you wanna flex or kind of bend at the asparagus. Where it breaks, so if it breaks there, that's where I'm gonna chop from. Most asparagus is picked as a bunch and so they're around and so they're growing at the same time. So you can just pop one and then cut from there. And then I want one inch sections, okay? And you don't need to blanch them, you don't need to do any of that. Um, the residual heat, the heat from that puff pastry and the steam will cook that for you. And then we have mussels, smoked mussels. So I bought a can, um, you can buy whatever kind you want. You can use oysters too. I actually was able to find oysters easier than I was able to find mussels. They smell really good, they're smoked, um, and so they lend that kind of smoky flavor to it. Now let's get started. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my salmon, grab a bowl, and I'm gonna season my salmon. So I'm gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper. And if you guys have not seen this, ah, I'm about to lose it. This is fresh nutmeg. So nutmeg comes in a nutmeg, like a, a nut like this. It lasts a lot longer. If you don't use that much nutmeg at home, buy them like this, use a microplane and just shave as much as you need. And then you can take that nutmeg and you can use it. This lasts a lot longer than if you were using the pre-ground stuff. I'm just gonna mix that, make sure everything is seasoned, and there we go. Now I'm gonna grab my, and I'll move everything to the side. Switch it around, because I did this once, and I did not do it on the actual parchment, and 
and that was a mistake because transferring it was not easy. So I've got that. I'm gonna kind of figure out where half is. So I'm gonna cut this in half, just like that. I'm gonna keep one side, keep a piece to the side. And I'm gonna lay my salmon piece. Oh, I'm gonna start with my asparagus right on the bottom. And then I'm gonna lay my salmon on top. So fit what you can. You'll play around with the proportions a little bit. That little piece was extra, just like that. And then I'll add my mussels and my asparagus, my grapes. And then the most important part was the chopped pistachios. And so I'm gonna chop up some pistachios. What I found was also if you do half of it, you're left with one piece, an extra piece of um, the puff pastry so you can make some designs. And I'll show you how I did some of the designs. So I'm gonna grab some pistachios. and get them already kind of hold for you so it's easier. And just a, you can put them in the food processor to do like a really, 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 really fine grind on them. Or if you feel comfortable enough with a knife, just go in there and chop it up as fine as you can. Again, this provides that really cool crunch. And pistachios just have a really cool flavor that most nuts don't, or it's just a different flavor. So I'm gonna add that. Sprinkle that right on top. Just like that. All right, now I'm gonna grab my saved piece of dough and I'm gonna put it right on top and pinch. Now comes the fun part. You're gonna make this into a fish or try to make it into a fish or design it to be so. So I grabbed a knife and I kind of just played around with it. And made that part and make sure you seal it all so that nothing comes out. And this is when that extra piece sometimes helps. So I'm gonna keep going around, right? And then a tail. So what I did was I pushed one end in and I can kind of get a tail out of here or that could be the head area too. But then what I did was I took the dough and any extra flour you might have, roll it up. And if you have a cutter or something that can kind of give you a shape of a scale, you can go around and you can put the scales on. This takes a long time, so take your time with it, but you can lay your scales on or you can take a spoon and you can make indentations throughout the whole thing, okay? So you would just go through the whole thing and make indentations. And then you're gonna brush it with a little bit of your egg wash, because you're using puff pastry, and sometimes adding the uh, egg wash on top and then putting the scales on helps too. And then you're gonna pop this in your oven and you're gonna bake it. I'm gonna bake it for about 40 minutes, 20 minutes, um, and then I checked on it a little bit after that. Um, and so then after that, we take it out of the oven and ba bam we have a full fish ready to go. So I don't know if you guys can kind of see that. There we go. All right, so with the scales and the tail. Should I cut through this, Julia? Francine, should I cut through it? 
Sure. Yeah. Go for it, it, right? All right. I've been waiting. I've been waiting to cut through it. So I am going to cut it and show you what it looks inside, like inside. I'm going to take my knife and cut right through the middle. And there's this beautiful filling. I just want to show you the layers. That's why, because it's really pretty. But there you go. There's like that beautiful oh, filling right wow. in the middle. <laughs> so it's very impressive and not that hard, everyone. Okay. And you can play around with the ingredients. Like, um, do different types of filling, do a different vegetable, whatever's around. But it was a lot of fun to make, Francine. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so are, there's, are there some things to be careful with, like not make it too wet? Or And Francine, I know you've cooked this dish also. Um, if we were going to experiment with the, um, the recipe and add different kinds of vegetables. Would you like the asparagus is probably good because it's kind of on the drier side. Won't get um, your. Yeah, I, I always I, I love playing around with things, but I, I often like to try it the first time the way it was intended, um, except if you really know your ingredients well. Uh, this combination was really, really great um, because too strong of a flavor, you know, like broccoli would overpower the, the fish. Um, so try it the way it was written first. And then sure, if you have trouble, I mean, certainly as um, as Jessica found, instead of artichoke hearts, you could use the, instead of the bottoms, you could use artichoke hearts, um, gooseberries, grapes, uh, any color grapes. So, but it's it's yeah. really fun. And it's really the artist in you uh, and the any kids at home who would like to do a little sculpting. It, it, it really is kind of, Want to play with your food. <laughs> well, I know you started this as a kind of cooking project with your kids for school and it became a cookbook. Exactly. <laughs> really, really fun it's for amazing that one can learn history and drama through these tactile activities. Before we so, move back to the PowerPoint, um, there's a couple of questions here about this dish from our audience. One is from Valerie who asks whether either of you can recommend a wine to pair with the salmon. Francine? White wine, your favorite white wine, a nice dry white wine that you would drink with fish. Um, salmon is nice and oily, uh, and so that I think it can stand up to, to whatever you'd like, a good Chardonnay. And then uh, Ellen Mirowitz asks if there's a, a kosher substitute for the smoky mussels or oysters. What would you add if you were trying to do a... Uh, you could omit them. You could omit them, mm -hmm. yeah. I probably wouldn't want it to go with anchovy or anything too strong, right? Maybe a little. I mean, I think anchovy is always good in everything. Um, <laughs> so I think a little anchovy would be excellent. Good call, Julia. And Sue Purcell says, how about chestnuts? <gasps> Yum, that's <laughs> good thinking. Yes, that's a good ingredient substitution. And so feeling of the of the Elizabethan period of a food that they really loved. Good, good choice. Wow. Well, we're going to turn back to the PowerPoint and hear about the end of the meal, the dessert course, and then we'll return to Jess and um, get some more suggestions about how to cook some of these desserts. Wonderful. So um, now let's talk for a little second about the foods that Shakespeare didn't have, that they didn't have in Shakespeare's time. So there was no chocolate, no tea, despite the fact that England is so known for tea, no coffee, no chili peppers, no corn, no cranberries, no potatoes, no tomatoes. These were all foods that were discovered after after Columbus, after the New World, and did not become popular in England until much later. Um, in fact, t there was pasta, but it wasn't eaten with tomatoes. Uh, it would have been eaten, for example, with prunes, cooked prunes. Uh, and in fact, in Shakespeare's day, prunes were often a synonym for a wanton woman. And they were often actually served in brothels as well as they thought were thought to provoke passions. So 
foods that they didn't have, but they had lots and lots of foods that would be shared for dessert. Now, what happened is that you'd have that first course, all the little foods, then you would have the second course with bigger foods. In between, there would be entertainments, you'd be telling jokes, there would be wow dishes. And the idea that now we've come to the dessert Everyone knows each other better and things can get more bawdy and closer and even more fun. And so the jokes would have gotten even more intense. And there were lots that were recommended during the dessert period in case you were too shy in the first or second course. Uh, and so one of my favorites is basically the idea that a, a man is at home and he hears a burglar break in in the middle of the night and he starts laughing and the burglar is like huh, huh why are you laughing and the man says i don't know what you're going to find here in the dark when i'm in the daylight there's nothing of value that i ever see in my house uh these are plates called rondelles that were the dessert plates these are in an, a museum in england and if you can look very, very closely, you see some writing. And that's because each of these plates had little funny sayings or whimsical poems, uh, bawdy jokes. Um, for example, th this, this one is, you know, a, a person who is generous with giving wine uh, is never gonna lack for anything. Uh, or, or this one that's written on one of the plates, they made fun of lawyers forever since ancient Roman times. Uh, here lies a miracle denied who can. He was, he lived a lawyer and an honest man. Poor lawyers. Now the plates themselves were sometimes bawdy. This was from an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. Uh, gives new meaning to breastplate. Uh, this dessert plate also, I just go a little closer so you get a sense of what was uh, pictured in this plate. Anyway, this whole dessert course was considered to be a, an aphrodisiac. They wanted the guests to leave the, the dinner party and to go forth and multiply, to, to have fun. And so often, especially in the dessert, there would be aphrodisiacs. So fruit, certain fruit that was shaped like body parts were considered aphrodisiacs. So for example, these were called fruit uh, nipples, uh, raspberries and, and cherries. And fruit was considered to be very luscious looking and very sensual. But the desserts themselves were recreated into two body parts. Uh, this is called nun's breasts, a uh, dessert that uh, is still actually popular today. The dessert course always included cheese and nuts, just as it would today. Cheese, nuts, and fruit. Um, we see from this reference in Mary Wives of Windsor. And they would make all sorts of desserts with those ingredients. So there were wonderful nuts cooked with sugar into different kinds of brittles. And they would use every part of the fruit Fruit was very precious. They would candy it when it was in season. They would candy the peels of the fruit. They would never waste anything. And this dessert, which Chef Jessica will make for us tonight, is a citrus tart. And the tart was made with lemon and orange peels that were candied and then simmered with vinegar and pepper. A uh, very interesting combination uh, that they prized back in Elizabethan times. They would have served slowly candied fruits of all kinds as part of the meal. And of course, the famous Christmas plum pudding, which would have been seen on an Elizabethan table. Because if you've ever made pl plum pudding, you know that it is all sorts of dried fruits that are simmered with spirits and it lasts forever and it stays moist. So it's, a, it's a, a, a wonderful dessert and they prized it for that flavor combination and for its long lasting. This line shows us and under, shows us that 
certain interesting spices were used in desserts. Now, a warden um, was a pear uh, in Elizabethan English. And so this pie would have had saffron and pear. Nowadays, we think nothing of these Michelin star chefs that will use interesting combinations of spices in desserts. But this is something that dates certainly to the Middle Ages and, and Renaissance. They also made vegetables into desserts. In fact, the person who uh, found that you could extract sugar from parsnips was given a knighthood by Queen Elizabeth. So this is a delicious spinach pie that's mixed with spinach, ground almonds and sugar, and then topped with some other nuts, pine nuts. And of course, we've got vegetables as desserts still today, rhubarb pie and carrot cake. Uh, but there were some even more unusual ones in Shakespeare's time, including beets um, used in desserts. They sugar-coated spices. Spices, this is a beautiful, uh, painting illustrating uh, sugar coating these spices and the idea of spices especially during the dessert course was something that was very prized spices were very expensive two nutmeg would be the equivalent of a skilled carpenter's one month salary this is a recreation of an elizabethan banquet table showing a gingerbread house, perhaps a recreation of the guest of honor's home, uh, beautiful stained glass looking tarts made with jams and ginger and all of these spices were really valued. The in fact, gingerbread house, we get a little bit from that Elizabethan tradition of showing an esteemed house to guests. And all of these spices, ginger, nutmeg, cinnamon, all of these spices were thought to tingle the tongue. Any of those that were thought to tingle the tongue, it was also believed that they would tingle other places as well. And so they were considered aphrodisiacs and always included in the dessert course. After the dessert, the tables would have been picked up because tables weren't the way we think of today. There were not big, uh, dining tables that were sold, they were created to put on wood, put on sore horses. And so the table would have been picked up so that everyone could dance and there could be more entertainments. Um, so now let's be entertained with how to create our own dessert. Uh, and so we'll go back to Chef Jessica so that we can learn how to make citrus tarts. making the rose cookies oh i'm sorry oh, no, no, oh no, my god okay. no i uh, wrote that okay so i didn't even show you a picture of the rose cookies my bad um okay i, you, I sent everyone i think the uh citrus tart uh, recipe but the rose cookies let me just say um while chef jessica gets everything together the rose cookies were from a recipe that was handwritten and there was, oh, it's only in the Folger Library because there's just one copy of this book. The, um, a woman, uh, Sarah Long, wrote this book as a gift perhaps to her niece. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Julia, for a picture of the rose cookies. And the idea of using flowers, besides using, of course, vegetables was very, very common. They would use flowers in their salads and of course in their desserts and rose water and orange blossom were very popular. So we're gonna learn to make this adorable, beautiful rose cookie. However, in the list of recipes that Chef Jessica is gonna send you, I do think that we've got the citrus tarts so you can make them. All right, so I have a pound of butter. Oh no, sorry, not a pound of butter, half a pound of butter, two sticks of butter in here. And the recipe says to wash the butter with rose water. I believe that's what it said. And so we're not gonna do that, but we are gonna add some pretty cool stuff inside, including rose water and rose petals. And so I will get that, I'll show you that in a little bit. But in that butter, we're gonna do what we do for baking most of the time, especially cookies. And that is we're gonna cream butter and sugar together. 
this is probably the most important step of any baked goods or anything that you're trying to make in regards to a cookie because butter and sugar react really well together but they have to be combined well in order for it to actually react. And so if you've ever looked at sugar and felt it in between your hands, it's like little blades almost, it's sharp. What you're doing when you're creaming is you're actually incorporating that sugar, those little knives into the butter and it's cutting it then. So that each little piece of sugar is coated with a little bit of butter and that's where you get that great mouth feel. And so we're gonna cream these guys together and we're gonna add egg yolks and we're also gonna add some heavy cream. So I'm gonna start by separating my egg yolks, the eggs though, so that you can do this correctly. Now, what are you gonna do with extra egg whites at home? I always tell people you, they're great for your face and great for your hair, just don't use hot water. So if you have extra egg whites, old egg whites actually beat up better. So if you're interested in making macaroons, things like that, easier to make with old egg whites. So to separate them though, you're gonna get yourself two bowls, I'm gonna hit once and you're going to let that egg white fall off. Now, cold eggs are easier to separate, but when you're baking, you want to use room temperature ingredients, okay? We're gonna do it one more time. Separate it, let it fall through. If you ever get any kind of eggshell in there, like I did, not that we're using our egg whites, the inside of an, the egg has kind of a thin membrane. It almost acts like a magnet and it'll attract that eggshell for you. So you don't have to use your finger to go in and dig it out. Just use a part of the eggshell, dip it in, and then you'll get it out. So we're not gonna use our egg whites, but we are gonna use our egg yolks in a little bit. So I'm gonna come on over and I'm gonna turn this guy on. Turn this thing on, there we go and we're gonna cream. Now, if you don't have a KitchenAid, completely okay. Handheld mixer will work, and if you do it by hand, it does work, it just takes a little bit of time, okay? So just make sure if you are doing it by hand that it's a pretty smooth, and fluffy consistency that you're at before you start adding other things. And that's it. So now I'm gonna add my heavy cream. I'm gonna, I have a quarter cup of um, the rose syrup. I'm gonna only add half of it. And then I'm also gonna add my two egg yolks in there. splashing people, it's not nice. <laughs> and whenever you're doing this, you will notice it looks like it's curdled, it's completely okay. And there we go. Now, this is like a shortbread or and so it doesn't have any kind of leavening agent. The leavening agent is probably, if anything, that little bit of um, egg yolk that you added. We're gonna add flour inside though. And we're gonna add pastry flour. Pastry flour is not easy to find these days. I have had a hard time. So Bob's makes a really good pastry flour. Now, why do you use pastry flour? The reason why you use pastry flour is because it gives it a lighter texture. Inside different flours, depending on what it's for, there's gluten inside. So the higher the gluten content, the, the chewier it will be. So bread flour, for example, is very high, high gluten, and so it ends up being too chewy of a cookie. This is a light cookie that kind of just breaks apart, and I'll show you what it looks like. So we're gonna use pastry flour. So if you don't have pastry flour, I would say use all-purpose flour. You could try cake flour, but cake flour does have cornstarch in it usually, so that sometimes doesn't work. I did not try it with it. I was able to find pastry flour after a while. So I'm gonna mix it. And you're only gonna mix it until it forms a dough. So don't overwork it. Okay. 
and that's it. So once that dough comes together, you're ready to go. All right, and then you're just gonna take this dough and you can shape it into rounds. Or if you want, you can mold these. And so I played around with a spritzer with this dough. Doesn't work well in a spritzer because it's, it's a little too wet. So what I would say is if you have a mold or like a cookie cutter, you could use it in the shape of a cookie cutter. I have a um, <laughs> moon cake mold. And so this moon cake mold will kind of give me that design if I push it out. And I did, did kind of, but it does, you can't see it really well, but there is a shape on there. So if you want, make them into rounds, which I did, and I baked them off. And then when you're ready, I'm gonna grab a cutting board. Once these have baked off, you're left with these little cute little rounds, like the ones that Julia showed you. And I've got that extra rose syrup. I have that extra rose syrup right here. And then I have candied rose petals. Now, these I was able to find on Amazon. They're not cheap. Um, and so if you want, you can actually make edible flowers really easily. All it tastes, takes is egg whites and sugar. So you get your edible flowers and they need to be edible. Um, Bristol Farms has really great edible flowers if you've ever, if you're around a Bristol Farms, but you don't want just flowers that you pick off the side of the road. You don't know what um, has been sprayed on it and so forth. So just be careful with that. You want real edible flowers and then you just coat them with a little bit, bit of egg white and then sprinkle them with sugar and they'll dry. So if you want, try to buy egg whites that are pasteurized um, if you're worried about that. So I'm gonna take these and I'm gonna crush some. And the rose syrup, um, we have a lot of great Persian markets around us and they actually have a good selection of rose syrup. You can buy French rose syrup too, so different types of rose syrup. And there's my powder. So I'm gonna take a little bit of this syrup, brush each of these cookies with it, and then sprinkle that really pretty rose petal right on top. And that pink is really pretty too right there. And there you are, these really pretty little rose cakes. There you go. Gorgeous, gorgeous. <gasps> is so pretty. Are there they other are. things that you can use that, that rose petal powder for? That um, That's a, such a pretty product. I would say you could put it on anything, even cakes. Um, it's really, it's fragrant, um, but it is that rose water. Um, taste or flavor. So you have to like that. I love it. So I like rose ice cream even. So, <laughs> Mariam Hassani has a question for us. She asks, would the actual rose petal non-candied work? And that would be a little chew that would be a little chewy. Um, but if you broke it up, you, you know, like just because a whole petal might be a little chewy to, to bite into with the cookie. But if you slivered it, um, although it's very easy to just, you know, as Chef Jessica said, to just brush a petal with some egg white and sugar or put it into a dehydrator. Uh, and so then you'll get little, little crumbles if you'd like. And then you did this food styling. Is that right, Francine, for your mm -hmm. book? Yeah. So there you have the fresh petals as decor with exactly. the rose cookie and it looks like you might also have maybe some thyme or baby mint or something that, that you've um, added there. 
Yeah, I think to just make the plate little, um, the food stylist put something, it does look like thyme, just to kind Perfect. of do something green. I mean, mint is often something that we will see on a, on a dessert plate. But I also think that if you play around with edible flowers, not only that wonderful fragrance of the rose, but lilacs, um, there, it's really interesting. And especially with chocolate, you could just take some chocolate and, and melt that and then incorporate your flowers into it. Uh, and so then when you dip strawberries into it, you get this wonderful combination of the floral and the fruit, something that the Elizabethans really enjoyed. Um, and I love that idea of the flowers, just like they were so precious with keeping their fruit, the same with edible flowers. And I, I love one of the uh, instructions, which we could all copy kind of once we, we can have a, a Zoom dinner party, but the instructions on how to make a salad fit for a prince was the exact title of it. And the idea is to take a big salad bowl and put a roll at the bottom of the bowl so that the center will look higher when you put all the greens. And then to take a tall branch of rosemary and stick it into the roll so that it sort of uh, is a centerpiece in the salad. And then to dangle from the rosemary pairs of cherries when they're in season and you can get two cherries hanging uh, or whatever comes to your mind. But that idea of that kind of thoughtfulness into the visual look of a dish, uh, I find you know, very compelling. And they even had instructions on how to replicate a flower, how to make a flat sort of salad that incorporates with the colors and the arrangements of vegetables and fruit. If you were to look from above, it looks as if it's a, just a wonderful uh, flower or garden. So very artistic because interestingly, today we'll put a vase on our dinner table, but they didn't in Shakespeare's time. They would have thought we were crazy to put flowers. Anything on the table is fair game, it's edible. Uh, and so no, and the flowers would have been eaten from the vase, uh, but you could have it in your in your salads. Oh, that's great. Um, couple of questions here. Uh, Sue Purcell is curious, do you know whether there were more or less food allergies during this period? That's an interesting question because someone asked about uh, food allergy like nuts, which are so common today uh, and asked as a substitute for the pistachios if you're, you have a nut allergy. And so, you know, if, I, you can always leave it out um, or put whatever your crunchy substitute uh, is, but I don't know. And that's an excellent, excellent question. I don't, I've never seen a reference saying, you know, if this ingredient makes you ill, use this. I, I never no. see, I've never no. seen that reference. And I'm wondering, and maybe we'd have to turn to a physician or nutritionist in the audience to tell us, um, I'm wondering if as we progress and the ingredients are less pure, perhaps, um, would develop allergies or maybe you just or a child mortality way. that the allergies would just have killed the less hardy children and by the yeah. time they became adults that if they had survived all those meals <laughs> i don't know of course there was also all that poisoning and right. you know, high, i mean high, they high. do they, they absolutely did reference that they thought some foods, especially some foods eaten at some part, parts of the day were very dangerous. For example, milk was not something that was, was recommended to, to be drunk. In fact, there were, were many um, uh, things written about milk being unhealthy for you. So perhaps some lactose thing, uh, certainly water, even water, they used to write that. Yeah. <laughs> Water was unhealthy. In fact, Shakespeare has a line, she is false as water because water was so dangerous. You, you could get sick uh, and they, they didn't know about germs, but they just knew water wasn't to be trusted. And so there were some things that they, they wouldn't eat, but I don't know about allergies. I will look that up. That's great. Um, Suze also would love to see a presentation of table settings throughout the ages. So maybe that's something we could do for another session. It would also be interesting to look at table settings around the world and how different cultures 
like to present their grander meals and uh, what some of the conventions are. It, it, um, it is very fascinating. And beside the, the tableware itself, but even the dish um, is a, a very interesting to, to peek at historically uh, and different cultures. I mean, the one I'm thinking of the wonderful boxes, Japanese boxes, where food is presented at this marvelous opening of a gift. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I've been reading the life of Cleopatra, getting ready to teach Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. And it's amazing to read about these feasts and um, some of their food ways are quite fascinating. Um, we're gonna end in a few minutes. We will be sending out uh, the recipes and we can probably include, is the rose cookie recipe in the packet? Cause I could just photocopy it and add it if it's not in there, but it is great. But maybe we could end by, um, Francine, you're just telling us about how you came to write this book. Um, and I will. Uh, and I also want to mention just talking about the fancifulness of the table. I want to just mention one page that sort of shows to the extent that the host would go to amuse and to entertain you. Um, and so that this one explanation was that you should create, the chef should create a ship, a pastry ship, a ship made out of dough uh, as a centerpiece, and then to give every guest a dinner roll in the shape of a cannon to kind of keep this battleship a theme going. And the ship, the little rolls that look like cannons should have some kind of accelerant on them, some, some camphor that could be lit and would make a little popping sound so that it would sound as if there was in fact a sea battle. Then they advised that you give every lady at the table an egg that had been hollowed out and filled with scented water. Just with the instruction being when she starts to hear the, when the ladies start to hear the noise of the cannons popping, that they should throw their eggs on the floor so that it makes an additional popping, but so the wonderful fragrance of the eggs kind of gets away the sulfur smells from the rolls. So this is a pretty elaborate uh, dinner party. That's even before the first bite is taken of your food. Right, I think I've read that one. It's a wonderful cookbook that was written after the English Civil War, but remembering the glories of the, the court of Charles I. And so it was a, very much a royal setting and quite elaborate, really a whole narrative there that was kind of dramatized. It was quite extraordinary, but there's also nice, interesting cookbooks written by women of the period as well. Um, Hannah Woolley, for example, you know, who taught women and um, was quite an interesting character. And, and she has some very charming uh, more modest kinds of recipes, more Protestant, if you will, <laughs> kinds of recipes that still are quite, quite evocative of the time. So it's, it's great. Well, even in Shakespeare's time, uh, there were handwritten manuscripts like the Sarah Long. Yeah. And of course, a home cook uh, would have more modest expectations. But again, you have to remember that back then, literacy was so low. So who was reading this cookbook? You're talking about, a, you know, seven to top 5% of the population who could have a home, who could entertain this way, who could read. Uh, and so clearly the, the cookbooks were, were much simpler. Uh, and in fact, I'm often asked at the end of these talks, well, you know, these things are kind of fancy with the, with the swans and the, the peacocks. Uh, by the way, someone asked, what does swan taste like? Tastes like chicken. No, I, I don't. I don't know actually. Uh, although uh, even written in the cookbooks of Elizabethan time, there were reference to the fact that it's pretty, but it doesn't taste so great. Um, even back then, they they did uh, love the taste so much. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to have you here, um, Chef Jessica. Always so great to work with you. This was just a delightful presentation and um, we'll see you at another event. It was really great to host you.